continue with our study of 2 Timothy. We are in chapter 3, and we've just concluded a section that is very serious. It is very sober. It's a warning about what's going to happen as the return of Jesus Christ gets closer. And his warning had to do not with what was going to happen in the world, although certainly those things would be true. He's saying, watch out, Timothy, because these things are going to be true in your church. And he gave a list of 18 or 10, 20 different qualities that would be true of the people in the church that is deceived as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And he says, Timothy, just be warned. If you're warned, you can also prepare for it. And so we had left off with verse 9 of chapter 3. Now, the word that I want to give you for this section that we're about to see in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 17, is the word integrity. The word integrity in English has the idea of soundness, wholeness, or completeness. Let me give you two examples. The, the, ship of a, the hull of a ship that has integrity has no cracks in it. So as this monstrously large boat made of metal sails across the ocean, it doesn't sink because there are no cracks in the hull. That's integrity. Uh, in the airplane in which I will fly home in, I hope that the fuselage has integrity. I don't want there to be cracks. I don't want there to be holes because the pressure at that altitude, that airplane would explode if it does not have integrity completeness, wholeness. Uh, when I think of the word integrity, I think of the way people dress, especially ladies who have a fashion sense, like, like the ladies in our class, that the things that you wear match the top and the skirt or the shoes or the particular way you do your hair. All of it has to come into harmony. There's a wholeness. That's integrity. Well, what does that look like in the Christian life? Paul is going to ask Timothy, to have integrity in his life as he leads the churches in the city and the surrounding area of Ephesus. But the problem is, Timothy lived in an era much like ours today where image was often more important than substance. That looking right was more important than actual integrity. So what do we do in a culture in a time in which the appearance sometimes is more important than the heart. Paul says to Timothy, let's go back to the heart. Let's have integrity. Let's have soundness. Let's have wholeness. You look at the Apostle Paul's life. He's sitting in this prison. And, and if tradition is to be believed, he's not at ground level. He's not one level below the ground. He's two levels below the ground. In this cistern that was turned into a place to house about 30 prisoners, it's cold it's damp, it's dark, he's chained to a Roman guard, and he's trying to pen this letter. And as he looks back in his life, his life in Christ, Paul, I think, would say, I have not been perfect, but my Christian life has had integrity. Let's go to where Timothy is. Timothy is in the city of Ephesus. He's a teacher. He's a very skilled teacher. He's a bit nervous. He's a bit timid. He's a bit passive. He's trying to lead these churches, but for Timothy, I think integrity is a real problem. He, he's, he's swayed by this particular problem over here, and he's hit by this particular problem over here. And for Timothy to try to manage all of these complexities makes it very hard for him to have integrity, soundness, wholeness. So what Paul does in writing to Timothy in verses 10 through 17 gives a lot of very detailed instructions that will help Timothy find integrity in his life. So what I'd like to do is read with you 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Here's what he says. You, however, so he's talking to Timothy, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from all of them the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, 
Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Now, just a very short note. Verses 16 and 17 are two verses that almost every child growing up in church learns because it's the priority of Scripture and what it means and how it's been inspired. But we'll come back to that in a few minutes. We're talking about integrity. What does that look like? What Paul does first is he has Timothy say, Timothy, I want you to look at my example. Paul's not bragging. He's not saying that he's perfect, but he's saying, Timothy, if you look at my life since I became a follower of Jesus Christ, my life has integrity. If there's a line that I could give you that would summarize what we're about to see, this is how I'd like to say it. What you feed will grow. But what you provide food for and what kind of food you provide determines what kind of growth you will have. Whatever you feed will grow. But if you don't provide quality, healthy food, the kind of growth you'll get will not be healthy. Let me give you an example. I enjoy a good uh, bottle of Coca-Cola and some potato chips. But if the only thing I ever ate was to drink Coca-Cola and eat potato chips, I would not be healthy. My heart would have problems. My weight would have problems. I'd be unhealthy. So what I do is I eat healthy things. I drink water. I have water in my cup right here. I like fruits. I like vegetables. We have a garden back home that we're beginning to harvest when we'll get back with peas and beans and carrots and corn. And our family loves these these healthy vegetables. See, if you feed on something, you'll grow, but the quality of what you eat is going to determine what kind of growth you have. So the kind of growth that Paul has had, he says, Timothy, you can look at my life. I have feasted on good things. I have lived in such a way, and you've seen it. Look at the qualities. He lists a whole list. We'll look at them in little groups here. The first three, you can look at my teaching, my conduct, and my aim in life. He says, look at how I have lived. We've used this phrase over and over again. Belief drives behavior. Timothy, as you've looked at my behavior, you understand what I believe. My conduct, the way I live, you've heard my teaching, you've heard what I say, you've heard my aim in life. Now, as you've come to this class over the last couple of weeks, or as you've been listening on, on the DVDs, you've been hearing my teaching, but you've not been able to observe my life. You don't know what I do with the other hours of the day that I'm not here. But if you and I were to spend time together for the next two weeks, and we would spend all of our time together after class, before class, together at lunch, together at supper, stay in the same place, you would observe whether what I believe and how I live have integrity. You would say, oh boy, you know, he taught this in this class, but when we watched him as he went for his walk into the town and was visiting and trying to visit with some other people, the two things didn't quite match up. You'd say, Bruce, your integrity is lacking. But Paul invites them to say, Timothy, listen, my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, it's had integrity. Look at the next couple. My faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. He says, faith is, is another word for trust or trustworthiness. Patience. I don't think I even need to explain patience. It's our ability to persevere, to, to not blow up as soon as something bad happens. Someone described it this way. It's the ability to put up with something for a long time. Love. The word for love here is agape love, self-sacrificing love. And steadfastness means the ability to, per, to persevere. Yesterday we used the example of the marathon runner who, who runs one mile and five miles and ten miles and gets to mile 20 and then hits this mental and emotional wall that says, I want to quit. And his, his mind says, no, I have trained for this. I'm going to keep going. That's perseverance. 
Timothy, you've watched it. You've seen, you know that I have integrity in these areas. But it's when it comes to verse 11 that we kind of pause and say, this is where it gets difficult. This is what you've seen. Verse 11 says, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. If you want to know somebody, you really want to know them, you need to watch them in difficult times. When a young man and a young woman are beginning to date, such as I did with my wife many years ago, when you go out on a date, and at least in the American culture, a date means that the young lady dresses up and she puts on some perfume, and the young man cleans up and he puts on some nice clothes, and he picks her up in his car, or he walks by her house and they go for a walk, or they go on a date, or they go out for supper, something. But both the young man and the young woman are on their best behavior. And at the end of the night, they say, that was a wonderful time. I enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Can I see you again? Yes, that would be great. And but they aren't really getting to know each other until they're in some kind of crisis. When the young man or the young woman goes through some great difficulty, that's when you find out what their character and their integrity is like. And Paul says to Timothy, he says, you know what happened to me in these three cities. One of the three cities is the hometown of Timothy. It's the city of Lystra. The other two cities, Antioch and Iconium, are two other cities that are within a small radius of where Timothy's hometown was. I'm not going to tell you the full story, but let me tell you the brief story of what happened in each one of these three towns. Let's begin with the city of Antioch. Paul's preaching there, and uh, he's having a great effect, but some of the Jews got jealous, and some of the people got all stirred up, and they came after Paul, some influential women and men, and they got Paul driven out of town. Timothy, do you remember that? So Paul goes a few miles to the east to the city of Iconium. Paul preaches. Jews and Gentiles were getting saved. It was great. The gospel was being spread. People were being saved. It was wonderful. However, the city began to be divided over Paul. And there was problems, and a plot was hatched to stone Paul and to kill him. But Paul got out of that city. And it's like, Timothy, do you remember that? We get the impression that almost every city that Paul went into, he got thrown out of. But what happened in the city of Lystra? Something great. Timothy's hometown. There had been a man that came to Paul with crippled feet. And Paul had, had, had uh, healed him. And the people, instead of worshiping God, began to worship Paul. And they said, you're a God. We want to worship you. And Paul said, no, 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 no. You can't worship me. Please don't worship me. Don't worship me. Worship my God who gives me the strength to do this. And so he was having struggles with this. And then what happened was people from the other two towns that he had been kicked out of came and they stirred up trouble. And this time they didn't just try to stone Paul, they did. I watched a movie a, a few months ago about a stoning of a woman. It was horrible. It was terrible. There were parts of it that I couldn't watch. Essentially, what they do is they tie the person up with their hands behind the back. They dig a hole in the ground, and they bury you up to your waist. And then they fill in the dirt around you so you can't move, and your hands are tied behind your back. And in this particular stoning, they began to throw stones at the person, and they can't move. It's awful. It's terrible. Well, in the town of Lystra, they actually did this to Paul. They thought they killed him. In fact, in the book of Acts, it says they thought he was dead. They, they got him out, and they dragged him outside the town, and they left him there. And you know what happened? He got up. He walked not to the next town. He walked back into that. Can you imagine the, the look on the people's faces when Paul walked into that city? He was dead. We killed him. He's bloody. He's broken. He's beaten. He's alive. Paul says, Timothy, as you looked at my life, you saw what happened in each of these three towns. He says, I endured. And he said this, and this is the key. From them all, the Lord rescued me. Timothy, God wasn't done with you. 
These people thought that they could to finish my life. They could get rid of me. They could get me out of their town. They even thought they could kill me. But God wasn't done with me yet. The Lord rescued me. I endured them because of the strength that God gave me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's going to happen. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. As you think about your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, or maybe you're just new to this notion of Christianity, do you know people who have suffered for their faith, who have lives of integrity? I can think of some significant people in my life. The, the particular Bible camp that I went to as a little boy and then through my teenage years, the director of that camp, his name was Stan. He was a former cattle rancher, and God had called him into the ministry, and he had this old cowboy hat that he wore for years and years and years. But he had this amazing personality. He had this great depth of faith. He never had very much money. He and his wife, and he raised their children, but he had this wonderful disposition about him all of the time. And that man was like a mentor to me. His example to me was amazing grace in the face of tremendous difficulty. I think of a man like my basketball coach in college. In high school, when I played basketball, we had a very fiery coach. He was always yelling and pushing you to do this way. He was not a believer. But when I went to college, and it was a Bible college, I had a Christian coach. He was a relatively quiet man. When, when he was angry, he would let you know that he was angry and that your performance had to change, but he had a very great depth of character. We would travel to different towns who were many miles away, and we had time to talk in the vans in which we traveled. And, and this man, I saw his character and I saw his depth. His life was not easy. He was not wealthy. He was not rich, but he had integrity. What Paul is essentially saying to Timothy is, you can look at my life, Timothy. It's not perfect, but I have a completeness. I have a soundness. Let me ask you a question. Do you know people in your life that you would say, they have integrity? They have soundness. They have wholeness. They're the kind of people whose example that I can follow. You see, we need those kinds of examples because in verse 12, he makes the promise. He said, everyone who desires to live a, a godly life will be persecuted. Some of you, I'm sure, have relatives who have been persecuted for their faith. Maybe in this country, maybe in different countries, or you've heard stories. In this age of the Internet, you can hear all kinds of stories of people who are persecuted for their faith. Even in America, it's getting more difficult to live your Christian faith. More people are saying, you know, that's okay for you, but the Christianity thing, it's so narrow. Please, Christians, just be quiet. And more and more restrictions are being placed on Christians. It's still not persecution like many of you have faced in your family, but it's coming. Because the enemy is on the prowl. He's going to make sure that being a Christian is not easy. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for 
tvs.gift at gmail.